Well, good morning, and welcome to First Baptist Church. Uh, it's a joy to be with God's people and to be worshiping together. Um, what I want to do is I want to begin uh, with just uh, a call to worship from the Psalms, uh, just to set our minds and hearts on why we're here. The reason we gather is, is to worship God, right? The, the reason we gather is, is to meet with God through his word and with his people. And so let's uh, just remind ourselves of who our God is. And this is from Psalm 62. For God alone, my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock and my salvation. My fortress, I shall not be greatly shaken. How long will all of you attack a man to batter him like a leaning wall, a tottering fence? They only plan to thrust him down from his high position. They take pleasure in falsehood. They bless with their mouths, but inwardly they curse. For God alone, O oh my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my salvation and my glory. My mighty rock, my refuge, is God. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Those of low estate are but a breath. Those of high estate are a delusion. In the balances they go up, they are together lighter than a breath. Put no, ho put no trust in extortion. Set no vain hopes on robbery. If riches increased, set not your heart on them. Once God has spoken, twice have I heard this that power belongs to God, and that to you, O Lord, belongs steadfast love, for you will render to a man according to his work. God is our rock and our salvation, and we live in a world that is constantly telling us to trust in everything but him. And so we want to start this morning by uh, acknowledging that he is our only rock, our only refuge, our only hope for salvation. So we're actually going to stand and sing this morning. So if you want to stand and sing with us, we're going to begin with that. Um, we haven't um, been doing that. Uh, we've been doing it at the end. Uh, we're trying to do, th do things as safely as possible. And uh, we figured, and I know the science is up in the air about this, but... We figured we could sing at the end, and then when we all leave, we're just walking around in everybody's uh, breath, or we could stay seated six feet apart and uh, let it settle throughout the surface. So this is 2020, is it not? So let's, uh, let's sing together about our mighty fortress.
this next song we're going to sing is a, is a n sort of newer one uh, to us. We've been singing it a little bit over the past um, few months. And it's called Come Behold the Wondrous Mystery. And I thought it would be worth um, pointing out that mystery, as it's used here, is not um, used in the way that we typically use it. It's used in the biblical sense, which is uh, an unveiling or revealing of God's plan. So Christ is uh, the mystery revealed, uh, meaning that, He's, he's, it's not that he's hidden and unknown, it's that he was uh, uh, foretold of by the prophets and now has been revealed uh, in the gospel. And so this song invites us to come and worship him and meditate on what he's done for us.
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending the promised Messiah, the Lord of all, and the Savior of all, and that we can receive him in the righteousness that he gives us simply by believing, by entrusting ourselves to him, and our sins are forgiven. They are washed away as a gift from you, and we praise you for that this morning. Heavenly Fathers, we look at our world around us. It is filled with chaos and anger and fear and worry. And we, as your people, have even fallen into those sinful attitudes and sinful actions. I pray that you would forgive us for every unkind word that we have spoken or perhaps typed. I pray that you would forgive us for being filled with fear when we know that you are seated on the throne. And I pray that you would give us strength and faith to live lives that glorify you in the midst of these dark times. And I especially pray for your church, and our church is a local manifestation of your universal body. Father, I pray that you would unite us. I pray that we would love one another and that through our love, through our unity, the world would see something that they cannot attain on their own. That although the world is filled with division, I pray that your church would be united. That we would love one another. That we would care one another and that by our lives and our testimony, we would bear witness to a reality that will exist and transcend and uh, persevere despite all of the trouble that we see. We are waiting for a new heavens and a new earth. You have given us a great hope, and you've secured that already in our hearts by faith. We thank you for that. Help us to live lives that are worthy of the calling you've given us. We pray now that as we hear from your word, Father, I pray that you'd soften our hearts. Help us to see who you are. Help us to see the gospel more clearly and leave this place ready to submit to your will no matter what it requires of us. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, good morning. It is uh, good to see everybody out this morning as we um, worship our great God together and we learn from His Word. Uh, I say this um, often in different ways, but I just want to be clear. One of the reasons that we study God's Word is because this is the way that He has revealed to us, Himself to us primarily, um, in, in the sense that that's, this is what we have, Right? He revealed Himself through His own Son, Jesus Christ. It would have been great to be around Jesus, wouldn't it? I mean, to be a disciple of Jesus and to hear Him teach at His feet, this is God teaching us. That would be incredible. We don't have that privilege for Jesus to do that in person, but we do have His Word and we do have His Spirit who helps us to understand His Word so that we could know truth. We do not have the authority to make up things about God that we just would like to see in God. We don't have a McDonald's Jesus, right? We don't go through the drive through and order up what we want. Um, he's already revealed himself through his word, and that's why it's so important. And so anything that we know about God and about um, His work and His ways, we see it in the Scriptures. And so as we get into this book this morning, uh, I just want to remind you that this is uh, a time where we're not, um, I might be a mouthpiece for what's going on in the Scriptures, but my goal is that the Scriptures would teach you and that the Spirit of God would transform you because these are His words, not our words. 
As we um, get ready to jump into this passage, I want to um, remind us of the argument of Romans so far because this is critical that we keep in mind the greater context of Romans as we dive into uh, this passage or any passage of Romans for that matter. Paul has been making the point from the very beginning of the book that the gospel is the power of God and the salvation of all who believe. Matter of fact, if there was a thesis statement in, um, in the book of Romans, I think this would be, Romans 16 and 17 would be the thesis statement of this book. And he takes the entire, well, he takes the first um, 11 chapters to really talk about the implications of that thesis, kind of making his argument that the gospel is indeed the power of God and the salvation of all who believe, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. For a righteousness from God has been revealed to us, a righteousness that comes by faith through faith. And so now he's, he's been making this argument, and he starts out in the first uh, three chapters, two and a half chapters, and, and he reveals to us that all have sinned. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile. We have all the, base, the same base problem. We're just sinful. We're sinful by nature. It doesn't matter what your um, ethnicit, ethnicity is, your, your religious upbringing, um, your moral, perceived moral character. It doesn't matter. We have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. This is the argument that he's been making. So we are all alike under sin. And he establishes that only a righteousness that is apart from the law or apart from works that, com- that, that comes through faith in Jesus Christ only a righteousness that comes through faith in Jesus Christ is effective for bringing about salvation. And he meticulously proves that, that though the law is good and from God, it actually brought death to us and it shows us just how sinful we are. So he establishes that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus and that God's people are not identified by the law, but by the Spirit. He further establishes that God's people, um, and he further establishes that, that his people is based on his election, which includes Gentiles, and that Christ himself is the end of the law, which Pastor Andrew taught last week, Romans chapter 10 specifically verse 4. And so this gospel does indeed reveal a righteousness from God that is received by faith. This gospel is powerful and has powerful implications for his people. And this morning, what I'd like to do is continue looking at these powerful implications by jumping into verses 5 through 13 I'm going to make three observations about that passage of Scripture, that chunk of Scripture, and then uh, I want to look at the, the liberating implications of true faith. Before we do that, let's pray. Father, as we open up your word and we get into it this morning, may you teach us through it. May our lives be changed. May our thinking be aligned with truth. May we orient ourselves around what is true about the gospel and its implications in our lives. Father, just about everybody in this room has been around your word and has been around your church for a very long time. And Father, it is so easy for us to in some ways become very complacent and in some ways forget about the implications of the gospel as we live out our lives. So Father, would you remind us anew this morning what these implications are for us in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me read the uh, passage for us. This morning, uh, verse 5, it says this. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the command, commandments shall live by them. 
But the righteousness based on faith says, do you say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? That is, bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the abyss? That is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what it does say, the word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is, the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. <clears throat> For Scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on, his, on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So let me look at some of the observations. First observation I'm going to make today is that salvation is impossible to attain by human effort. Okay, this shouldn't be a shocker, um, but yet this is where I believe that, that Paul is reminding us in verse uh, 5 through 7 this truth that salvation is impossible to attain by human effort. Why do I say that? He starts out by saying that Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that a person who does um, the commandments shall live by them, but the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend to heaven, uh, that is to bring Christ down, or who will ascend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. What makes the law, so, so Paul is, is talking about the weakness of the law here, reminding us that the, the law cannot save us. There's a weakness to the law, but in reality, it's not because the law necessarily is weak. It's just weak to save us. Um, what makes the law weak to save us is the fact that we're too weak to keep it. That's what makes the law weak. And, and so, if we think that our obedience earns us the uh, right standing with God, if that's how we're living our life, if we're living our life, we've got we to obey the set of rules laid down for us in, in order to be good enough for God, then what we're essentially doing is saying that we must live completely in obedience without stumbling. If we're going to live that way, we have to say, we have to come to the conclusion that you're going to have to keep the law completely. If you're going to live by the law, you're going to try to find righteousness through the law, then you've got to live by the law completely. And there's only one man that did that. His name was Jesus, and he died on our behalf. James 2.10 says this very thing. He says, whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. And so if you're gonna if you're gonna live by the law, you're gonna look at salvation and try to try to gain righteousness by following a set of laws, of rules, then you must live completely by them. And the bad news is <laughs> we will never do that. We are too weak. And so salvation is impossible to gain by human effort. I mean, we even look at, if you look at verse uh, 6, it says, but, this righteousness, but the righteousness based on faith says, the first thing it says, there's some negative things it says, right? Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down. What in the world is he talking about? What helps me to understand these two verses is to understand the very, some of the very central truths of the gospel, and that is this starts with the incarnation, that Jesus himself, God the Son, came to earth, took on flesh. Second piece that's so central to the gospel is the resurrection. God sent his Son, took on flesh, he came to this earth, he lived, he kept the law completely, he died. He died 
Didn't deserve to, but he died in our place. He was buried. And then he rose from the, the grave. And the reason that the resurrection is so central to this, because the re- resurrection is actually an affirmation that Jesus is who he claimed to be. If he would have stayed in the, in the grave, he would not have been the Son of God. But indeed, he is the Son of God, which is proved by the resurrection. So The resurrection is so important that if you read the book of Acts, the book of Acts talks about the central piece of the resurrection. Matter of fact, when we, um, when we read in Acts 1-8, um, when Jesus is telling the disciples to stay in Jerusalem, um, they'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on them to be his witnesses. Now, if you do a careful reading of Acts, what you're going to find is, what were they witness to? And what Jesus is referring to is, they were witness, they were a witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that they have seen the resurrected Jesus. And some might argue, well, what about Paul? And all you have to do is refer to Romans chapter, or Acts chapter 9, when Paul came to know Christ, and Jesus manifested himself right there in front of Paul. And, um, and, and, and you read some of other, Paul's other writings, and uh, it alludes to the fact that he was taught by Jesus in the desert. But the fact is, the resurrection is huge. And, and so, I think what the author is saying, what Paul's saying here, is he's getting to this point of who, the person that accepts righteousness that is based on faith does not say in their heart, who will ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down. You didn't do that. You didn't make the incarnation happen. God did. Or they don't say to themselves, who will, um, who will descend into the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the grave? Because you didn't do that. No human did that. It was not a human work. That was the work of God. So we don't, we don't, there's, human effort is not in the equation when it comes to salvation. Instead, the word, instead, one who um, seeks a righteousness that's based on faith is one who says the word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. Which brings me to the second observation I'm going to make. And that, that, that is that salvation is possible simply because Christ is near. Christ is near. Verse 8, but what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. That there is this righteousness that comes by faith in Christ. And it is near. It is it is attainable, not because you have to work for it and follow an unattainable law, but that Christ is indeed near. The Word is near. Christ, who is the end of the law, has fulfilled the law and kept its demands. He died in our place. Therefore, a righteousness from God that is by faith in Christ is really right in front of us. All we need to do is call on His name. Now, I'm going to talk about what that means to call on His name in just a minute, but that is how near it is. We don't work towards it. It's not like salvation is this mountain that we're climbing that maybe one day, when it's all said and done, that we look at our works and think, okay, I might be good enough for God. Now, I know that none of you would even like verbally say, oh, yeah, I know we're not saved by works. I understand that. But I am awfully surprised many times that we have a tendency to live that way. And to think that way without even realizing we're thinking that way. That there are certain things, markers that we have to do in order to be good enough for God. 
And then we live our lives in guilt because we always find ourselves falling short. And the reality is that Christ has already done the work. Salvation is near. It's a righteousness that is attained by faith, not by works. Let me make a third observation on this passage. True faith is a deep internal conviction and external expression about the person and work of Jesus Christ. It's both. True faith is a deep internal conviction and external expression about the person and work of Jesus Christ. This is what Paul said, continues on. He says, um, after talking about the fact that the, the word is near us, in, in your mouth and in your heart, he uses these two, two analogies, the mouth and the heart. And, and the reason for that, um, I think he, he further explains in verse 9, he says, because... If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Let me talk about this passage. Many of you probably have used this verse in a Romans road presentation of the gospel, right? I have many times, right? And, uh, but what does it mean to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord? Does it only mean, hey, make a verbal confession. You need to make a convert, verbal confession that Jesus is Lord. If you don't say those words and make that verbal confession, then it's just not real, right? No, this is not what Paul is getting at. He's not talking about this that being so literal, but, but he, I think he's using mouth as as a metaphor for this external expression of your faith in Jesus and where the heart is more of this internal conviction about the personal work of Christ. You cannot separate internal conviction about the personal work of Christ from the outward expression of those convictions. So to confess that Jesus is Lord is this outward affirmation that one truly believes that Jesus is the divine Son of God. The word Lord used in this passage is the same Greek word that is used in the Septuagint. The Septuagint is a Greek translation of the Old Testament. So as you think about the Old Testament, the Old Testament was originally written in Hebrew. And then along, of course, you're living in a Greek society um, back, well, even before Christ came on the scene, but definitely when Jesus lived, it was a very uh, Greek, Greco-Roman world that he lived in. And, and there was a, a translation of the Old Testament testament into greek it's called the septuagint and the word the greek word used here for lord confess with your mouth that jesus is lord is the same word that's used in the septuagint to translate the hebrew word yahweh and at the very least this would be an expression that jesus has absolute authority over my life However, it, is, it, it would have likely communicated to Paul's audience something much, even deeper. That Jesus is the divine Son of God. He is Yahweh. He is divine. Not only is he boss, but he's our, our divine boss. Weaved beautifully in with uh, outward confession is inward conviction about the person and work of Jesus Christ. So not only do we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, 
our divine master, our divine king, our divine boss. He is, uh, the, the, there accompanies that this internal conviction about the person and work of Jesus. It says, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. God raised him from the dead? Why is that phrase in there? Again, I'm going back to the power of the resurrection and how central it was to the gospel. It's an undeniable affirmation that Jesus is the divine Son of God who defeated death on our behalf. If Jesus had died and stayed dead, then the cross would be empty of its power. But because Jesus really did rise from the grave, it demonstrates that he conquered death and has the power to save. So we hold these internal convictions. We believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, that he truly is the divine son of God who is our deliverer our rescuer. This is central to the gospel. And both of these internal convictions and external expressions weave together in the life of somebody who has genuine faith. Matter of fact, outward confession without inward conviction is just noise. Inward conviction without outward confession is just nonsense. This is the conclusion John Calvin came to. In one of his writings, he wrote this. It is quite nonsensical to insist that there is a fire when there is neither flame nor heat. To say, oh, I have faith, but there is no expression of that outwardly. It just doesn't make sense. And I know people say, you can't judge somebody's heart. I am not. I'm not sitting here going and looking at people and I'm going to judge their, and that's not what I'm, that's not my job. <laughs> my job is to teach what the Word of God is saying and there, what Paul is, I believe, clearly teaching is this interwoven thing with internal convictions and external expression. They go together. And so, again, Outward confession without inward conviction is noise. Inward conviction without outward confession is nonsense. I mean, before we get to the rest of the, the remaining verses, I'm going to actually talk about those in our implications because they are certainly um, words that give us implications of this truth, this, this truth that this inward conviction and outward expression are Married together, this is a part of what true faith looks like. And it's liberating, by the way. And so what I'm going to do is, is I want to answer the question, what are the liber liberating implications of true faith? There are certain things that true faith does for us. One is that true faith frees us to find joy under the authority of a loving and kind savior, savior. True faith frees us to find joy under the authority of a loving and kind Savior. Isn't that interesting when we, when we think of ourselves as submitting to someone, we don't often connect it with the word joy, right? Okay, I, I'm going to be somebody's servant. Yay. Right? I mean, there's, joy is just not one of those things you think about when you hear the word submission. But when you submit to a 
loving and kind Savior, it is joy. And when we live under His authority in our lives, it does bring about joy. And yet, living under the authority of Christ is more than just sins of commission. It's not, not doing what we shouldn't do. It's also doing those things that we are called to do. And oftentimes when we think of obedience, we only think of, well, I'm not doing what I shouldn't do. Okay? Okay. A is you probably are in some ways because we're not perfect, right? But B, it's more, obedience is more than that. Submission to God's will is more than that. Living under the authority of Christ is more than that. It is, it is submitting to what he has called you to do. And, and so to, to kind of help us think about this, uh, think of a spectrum. A spectrum that would start with those that are what I would, and these are people that would, Say, hey, I, I claim the Christian faith, all right? I'm a Christian, and I, I know that it's, it's terrible to make stereotypes, and um, nobody fits stereotypes completely, but this is a way we can think about this as a spectrum. You, you, can, you can find yourself in any of those, um, in any of those uh, categories. Will you go ahead and, and switch the slides? To, uh, from a tender to what I would term as the engaged. Let me, let me describe them and uh, help us wrap our mind around them. The attender is one whose vision for their life is to satisfy their own sense of religious obligation. Like, I, I, I want to make sure that, that uh, I'm doing my duty for my religious faith. And so... Their vision is to satisfy their own sense of religious obligations. And the driver, what drives them are deep internal convictions about the Christian faith itself. Well, I believe this stuff. I believe that Jesus is um, the, the Son of God. And uh, I, I believe this, but... But... At the core of it, they're, they're, what it leads them to is just to satisfy this sense of, of religious um, obligations. And what it leads to is this, complacency. It leads to complacency and spiritual boredom in their faith. I, nobody, nobody here has uh, um, really made the statement to me, Pastor, I just find the Christian life boring. But my guess is that many of you, most of you, have probably had those thoughts run through your head. It's just boring. I think it's boring, especially if you're just an attender. And what I mean by that is that you're not engaged in your faith in any other way except for when you come to church. It is boring because it was never meant to be that. It breeds complacency. In the middle of the spectrum, we have the involved. Those are people who the vision is to feel good about their contribution to God's kingdom. They always got to be doing things. Matter of fact, if they're not doing things, it kind of puts them into a little tailspin because they have been so used to doing things and finding satisfaction in doing the work of the church that their identity is wrapped up in it. And so as soon as they're not doing something for the church, they're in a tailspin. Their, their conviction is that they're, they have these deep convictions about God's church. They love God's church. They want to see God's church uh, advance. And, and the result of this is that they have moments of satisfaction. But oftentimes they're just empty on the inside. 
These are people that are doing the work of the Lord. But they're not pursuing the Lord of the work. Now before, before you start thinking, well, you know, that you should pursue Jesus, you know, that's, that's part of it. You know, I would venture to say that most of us get caught up in this category. That, that we, are, we like doing things. Is that, let me do things and let me feel good about doing my part in serving, whatever that might be. But we don't actively and intimately pursue Christ in our lives. Now here's the problem with it. The problem with that is that you will only have momentary satisfaction. And you will be running on, your spiritual gas tank is going to be empty. Burnout will come soon after. Matter of fact, in the ministry, it is so easy for... uh, when I go to conferences and we, we we'll go to workshops or read articles or books that are geared towards specifically pastors, it is, um, it is just a reality that it is so easy for a pastor to burn out because he has been doing the work of the Lord, Right? He's been serving, he's been trying to keep the church going and whatever it is, teaching people, but not paying attention to his own spiritual walk. Burnout is one of the consequences of that. And there are a lot more other, there's a lot of other consequences to that too, right? Moral failure, you name them. So the involved. And then there's the engaged. What are the engaged? The engaged are those, their vision is to know Christ and to make him known. They want to pursue Christ in his kingdom. And they want to make him known to the world. Matter of fact, in our vision, we have these words, Christ-centered and kingdom-focused. Because we believe that those two ideas, that you are Christ-centered, that you want Christ to be the central part of your life and thinking, you are abiding in Christ and pursuing intimacy with Christ, Christ is your life, Christ-centered. Kingdom focus means that you understand as a believer you've been called to a greater kingdom. And that God is at work, actively at work, in this world, and He invites you to join Him in that mission. That our life is not our own, and our plan is not our own. Our dreams are not our own. It is about the kingdom that God is building, and we are a part of it. Those are these two words that describe what we want to see, Christ-centered, kingdom-focused homes. And obviously that starts with Christ-centered, kingdom-focused individuals. So the engaged person is someone who, has, who, who knows Christ and wants to make Him known. And you know what? It doesn't, sometimes you can, you can look at this word engaged and you might be older in this room and saying, well, pastor, I just... I can't do the things I used to be able to do. I'm like, no kidding. (laughs) I get it, you know. But that that that's not what we mean by engaged. That doesn't mean how many volunteer hours you're 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 given to the church. I some of the most actively engaged people I know are people that can't volunteer in the nursery (laughs) or wherever it might be in the church but they're constantly sharing their faith with other people. Any conversations that come up, they're just, they're just expressing their joy and love for the Lord Jesus Christ. That's engaged. 
These are people that are pursuing Christ. These are people that are praying because they know that prayer makes a difference and matters. They're engaged in their faith. And what's driving them is a deep internal conviction about God's glory. So, on one hand, the attender says, man, I have these deep convictions about the Christian faith. It's the truth. I'm going to, you know. The attender says, I have deep convictions about the church. It's God's bride. We need to advance the church. And the engaged says, I have deep convictions about God's glory. And I want God's glory to be manifested here on earth through the church, through the Christian faith, through my life. And so they're pursuing Christ. And they are actively engaged in making him known in this world. And the result of that is contentment and joy. I can tell you from experience, because I've experienced um, different parts of this spectrum in my life, that when I'm actively engaged in my faith, making Christ known, that my faith is more alive than ever before. And there's a sense of joy that comes with knowing that I'm just simply being obedient. I remember having a conversation in college with another um, college student that was a couple years ahead of me, a friend of mine, that um, we were talking about evangelism, and uh, we were talking about uh, oftentimes the, the, what we want to see is just fruit. We want to see somebody make a decision. And that seems to be the motivator that drives people. And, and I'll never forget, he, he looked at me and he said, you know, what should motivate us is just simply being obedient. Let God do the rest. Simply being obedient. Never forget that. So not only does true faith free us to find joy under the authority of a loving and kind Savior, but true faith frees us to boldly live out our deep convictions about the person and work of Jesus Christ. Frees us to boldly live out these deep convictions. Why? Because it doesn't matter what people think of us. We can live out those convictions um, about the person and work of Christ. We've been free to do that. Third uh, implication is that true faith frees us from finding hope in false saviors. You know, we, we think that uh, if I'm going back to the first century, following the law is our savior. No, it's not. It's a false savior. If I just attend church, no, it's a false savior. True faith actually frees us from finding hope in false saviors. I mean, I could be talking, I mean, I, I, I certainly can be talking about other religions here, um, and, and certainly there are those that pursue other religions and their false saviors, right? But that's not my audience. I'm not talking to people that don't claim to know Christ. I'm talking to people that do na- claim to know Christ, that oftentimes we get caught up in... in um, pursuing false saviors and the reality is that true faith frees us from finding hope in false saviors I think the health and wealth prosperity gospel is a false savior that if you come to know Christ then you're going to be healthy and God's going to just give you an abundance of cash in your bank account I think it's a false savior Which, by the way, is, is kind, of, <laughs> kind of ironic that that never happened with the 12 apostles who suffered for the name of Jesus and died as a martyr with nothing in their pocket. True 
True faith frees us from finding hope in false saviors. True faith frees us from the shame of never measuring up. And this is, I'm going back to now verse 11 as we're continuing this passage. We believe, it says, confess with your heart that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you'll be saved. It says, for the, for the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. Everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. It frees us from the shame of never measuring up. You ever felt that way in your life? You constantly find yourself falling short. And you say, I just don't measure up. True faith frees us from that. We don't have to measure up in our own works. Because everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. Christ has done the work for us. And so we are imperfect people pursuing a perfect God. And yes, we want to be obedient to him. And yes, we pursue that. And yes, we pursue his agenda for this world. But no, you will never be perfect. frees us from shame. True faith frees us to live without prejudices towards others who are from a different culture, ethnicity, and country. Matter of fact, I would argue that one of the one of the points that Romans brings out, one of the themes, major themes, is this right here. Because it was dealing with a, a church that was divided along ethn- ethnicity lines, per se. Religious lines. You had Jews versus Gentiles. And there was division between those two groups. And Paul, that's, this is why I believe that Paul is, I mean, brings this up over and over and over again in the book. Doesn't make a difference whether you're a Jew or a Gentile. You're all alike under sin. You all need the, the Spirit of God. Uh, we're all in the same boat here. We're saved the same way. True faith actually frees us to live without prejudices towards others who are from a different culture, ethnicity, or country. Verse 12 says, For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on his name. Stop there for a minute. Bestowing his riches, not on some special group of people over here because there's a perception of them being more godly or having some kind of privileged um, access to God. No, all, all who call on him. That's who he's bestowing his riches on and then verse 13 for everyone who calls on the name of the lord will be saved there is no distinction between these ethnic groups and so it actually frees us from prejudices actually frees us to live without prejudices towards others who are from a different culture ethnicity or country This is why missions is is, is so important that there are people from different cultures and nations and tribes and languages who need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ because it's for them just as much as it is for us. We are not some privileged people to have an inside track The gospel is for all. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You know, I I didn't grow up in the church, uh, per se. I went to church sporadically as a kid when I was uh, living with my dad. I went to church, was living with him for a short period of time. There were moments that we went, and 
but it just was not a significant part of my childhood experience. And I responded, when I was in 10th grade, I responded to a message that was given at a revival at my buddy's church. And, and to be frank, I, I didn't know much about Jesus. I knew that he died on a cross. Now, I, I know this, this maybe sounds as a shocker, but I had no idea what that really meant. Okay, he died on a cross. Okay, cool. <laughs> I had no idea. I, I just didn't have that context. Uh, but the pastor I heard spoke very plainly um, at that revival. And he said, if you, did, if you don't get saved, you're going to burn in hell. <laughs> that was pretty plain. And I was like, oh, well, I don't like the idea of burning. <laughs> and, and so I responded. Uh, I went forward. I said a prayer. I got baptized a week later. But here's what happened um, in my life. Really? Nothing. Nothing really different took place in my life. My affections for sin stayed the same. My behavior stayed the same. My conscience stayed the same. I never really had an internal conviction about the person and work of Christ. It wasn't until a year and a half later I moved from Tennessee back to Ohio where I started living with my dad halfway through my junior year that the light bulb came on in my soul and at the center of Christianity was not me and my destination after I die but in the center of Christianity was Christ. And for the first time, I saw Jesus as the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. And I came to realize that he was not only my Savior from sin, but that he indeed is Lord. He's my King. He is the one that I am to honor and worship, and it was a game changer. It wasn't until this internal conviction about the person and work of Jesus um, that my external expression of faith changed. My affections changed. My courage was changing. My confidence was changing. My joy was changing. The things I found joy in. The gospel indeed transforms us. But it begins with deep internal convictions about the person and work of Jesus Christ. And then they manifest themselves in outward expressions. Maybe you're here today. And you would say, you know, Pastor, I can relate to that. I kind of seen Christianity as something that was all about me. And I just go through the motions, I play church. And I can be honest and say that I don't really have these deep convictions about the personal work of Jesus. Maybe that's you today. I can tell you there's hope because the word is near. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. He can save you. He can save you. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. Maybe you're here today and that's you. I would invite, I, I would love to have a conversation with you for I'll be in the family room afterwards. I'd love to, to um, be able to share a little bit with you. I'd love to hear your heart, pray with you. But maybe you're here and said, and Pastor John, I've just been living a lie. I've been living a life where it's been me at the center, not Christ. And I haven't, haven't truly surrendered my life to Christ. I haven't trusted in Jesus Christ. I would love to pray with you and help you see the Savior.
for who he is. Let's pray. Father, you have done a work in our lives that is unmatched. That salvation is near. The word is near. Jesus is near. Righteousness is near. Because of your work. Through your son Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you for the salvation that we have that's been offered to us. I thank you for the promise that any and every one who calls on your name confesses with their mouth that you are indeed Lord and believes in their heart that you indeed are, uh, have been raised from the dead, they will be saved. Father, thank you for that promise. Thank you for that invitation. Father, I pray for those that are sitting out here or maybe even listening that would say to you, God, I've just been playing games. I've just been playing church. I don't have these deep internal convictions about who you are. But I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you did indeed rise from the grave and that you are my king and my master you are my lord and i want to just give my life to you father those that are here today that would that is true of father i pray that you would bring about a conviction by your spirit and they will not ignore it you would draw them to yourself they would be freed from their bondage of sin. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. It's the end of our um, service today, but I would just encourage you. Um, there are questions on the notes. If you uh, didn't grab some notes, we have some extra ones out on the table. I would encourage you to, to gather together with a few people, or you can do this individually as well. I always think it's better to, uh, to gather together with a few individuals um, and uh, process some of those questions, work through some of those questions together. I think it's incredibly helpful. So. All right, Lord bless.